Hey guys, it's Debbie and I am doing another solo podcast with you as I'm trying to do a little bit more specific topics a couple times a week or every Thursday, sometimes Sundays, you might see a video pop up on my low carb athlete YouTube channel. And then the audio podcast app will show up on Thursdays. So here's the topic I want to dive into today. Are you going to be performing your best as an endurance athlete following a strict carnivore diet? Some people are doing a little more carnivore. I've interviewed different friends that are carnivore, but they're doing strength training and more bodybuilding. But what about if you are doing endurance sports? I thought of this idea for a topic on the show because I got this article came in my inbox somehow on carnivore. And I looked up uh, websites, to other blogs, see is carnivore good for the endurance athlete? So here's a great blog. If you're watching the video, carnivorestyle.com talking about carnivore diet for athletes, which athlete is a carnivore diet best for this is written by Timothy Woods, October 19th, 2022. So summary, a carnivore diet is recommended for athletes who want to lose weight or build muscle. High protein content in the only meat diet does help with muscle repair after exercise related tears. The best red meat for athletes on a carnivore diet includes beef, chicken, and fish. And they say the option to bulk up on a carnivore diet, you must do the right exercises, space out your meals routine frequently. All right, so if you're trying to do a carnivore diet or more people are saying, suggesting an animal-based diet, Dr. Stacy Sims talks about a plant-based diet. So we're gonna kind of talk about this a little bit more. For the endurance athletes, what is best for you if you're interested in fat loss, if you're interested in performance and you're interested in longevity? The three things I like to talk about in the show. Now, I like to coach my clients on personalized nutrition program. So we look at who are your ancestors? Where's your family from? Look at your genetic markers, look at your food sensitivities or food log and pay attention to red flags. If you have issues, higher heart rate, HRV drops from eating foods that are inflammatory to you heart rate will be up higher after food that doesn't agree with you. Also any gut health symptoms. So timing your nutrition with your exercise, looking at what duration of exercise program you are doing or workout session strength versus endurance. If you're doing HIIT training versus a low mapitone type of max aerobic function, MAF workout nowadays called zone one, zone two, but there's a lot to look at. So when we get articles and read blogs and social media posts on carnivore diet is best, it is, it depends, right? So if you have gut issues and we're going to talk about plant toxins in a moment, that sometimes it is a animal based diet really is what we need to look at for 30, 60, 90 days, sometimes longer. If you have a lot of irritation to your gut wall lining and issues, digesting anything with fiber. It works. It's a gut healing program. But if you don't have gut issues, should you be on a animal based diet or a strict carnivore diet? So looking at this carnivore style website, the impact on carnivore diet athletic style, there's information on here, but if you scroll down the carnivore diet for restricting carbohydrates, can it improve athletic performance helps faster weight loss, helps you have more stamina, produce athletic outcomes and information here that it might be in necessary for endurance athletes to slightly modify their diet so they can increase their calories and carbohydrate intake. People who exercise for extended period of time need to refuel constantly because their aerobic exercise consumes glycogen, the stored form of carbohydrates. This is from Natalie Allen, registered dietitian. Now I could argue about that comment. If you are a fat adapted athlete, if you have 
gone through that process four to six weeks that we've talked about in previous episodes of becoming fat adapted, a low carb athlete can train at lower heart rates and have even, you know, identify what is that highest heart rate can still burn primarily fat. So it depends on the intensity of your workout. If you are fat adapted athlete, I can go for a zone one, two run or bike ride and keep my heart rate, say 130 heart rate where I'm burning majority of my fuel from fat. So I don't need as many carbohydrates to refuel. I'm primarily fat burning, but that's where we need to test and not gas with the metabolic efficiency testing cart for a bike and for a run. And I'm hopefully going to be doing that soon with Pinoe locally and P N O E. You can find someone near you to do a metabolic testing for you. So to be carnivore, maybe a strict carnivore might it not be ideal for the endurance athlete, but perhaps more of a, an animal based diet with what we'll talk about. Paul Saladino adds in berries, locally grown fruit that's in season and honey. So carb timing, strategic carb timing, we've talked about a lot on this show the past year, especially that we can add in some carbohydrates pre-workout when we are going to be more anaerobic and females may improve their performance, adding a little carbohydrates before their workout, even if it's a fat burning heart rate range workout, their performance can be improved or may be improved. So what this article is saying, if you're looking to see significant improvement in athletic performance, you need to be more fat adapted. As I said, this means that your body's conditioned to use fat for your primary energy source for your training exercises. Being fat adapted enables you to eat less and stay full longer. This way you work out for longer without feeling hungry mid session, which I agree. And this is where it kind of gets confusing of to eat or not to eat because as I have shared my journey of being more fat adapted for 15 years, that I can go a long time without eating. But when I'm exercising more than once a day and I'm moving around a lot, that is going to also lead to other issues of low energy availability and not getting enough calories and not hitting those macros for my protein goals. So Being fat adapted is great, but when you're an athlete and we're working out at least once a day, we need to make sure we're eating or at least getting essential amino acids and some bone broth or things like that. Even if you're not hungry, you might need to add in more because it's easy to just eat one meal a day when you are fat adapted on days that you're doing low heart rate training. That's my personal experience. So this article recommends, of course, avoid highly processed foods and deli meat, processed meat, because they contain excess sodium and other, of course, stuff in there is not great, but looking at the carnivore diet for athletic performance, just strength training and bodybuilding can be beneficial. So the article talks just briefly about your endurance athlete, what to do. So you can look at this carnivore style.com strength training on carnivore diet, you know, going fatty meats. I just listened to Dr. Ben Bickman on a podcast recently with Dr. Mindy Pels. I listened to it twice on my drive to Palm Desert to my mom's house. And I find it makes a lot of sense that you're going for fatty meats. And this is why I think meat gets a bad rap because of the bad crap in me if it's factory raised meat. So ideally, if you can afford it, it's ideal (laughs) to get grass fed quality meat. And it does add up, but you can get like butcher box, or I've been using wild pastures and get a meat delivery service that gets you good quality meat. So you want to have the protein and the fats and natural fats in the meat. So you're not going for the lean cuts as Dr. Ben Bickman says, higher protein diet is great with a healthy fat that naturally comes with it. So not getting the non-fat meat, like we used to do non-fat, everything, get the naturally occurring fat, but not from toxic factory farm raised animals. This article also talks about timing your meals. You know, this is my thing about being more carnivore ish. I 
can't eat meat or eggs and, and go work out when I go swimming at noon. So when I figure out my morning workout, it might be at the gym or it might be for a run or combination. And then I'm, you know, 7am to 11am, I need to figure out what to eat and time that meal because I swim masters at 11:45 a.m., I need to properly digest that food. So, what to eat might not be high uh, animal based because of two day workouts. If you listen to previous podcasts within eight hours, that's when you can add in some nature's carbs, not crappy carbs, in with that fat and protein. So. This article talks about eating meat at least 50 minutes before going to the gym. For me, I need to eat like three hours before I work out if I'm having like a steak. So everyone is so individual in how their digestive system works and how long it takes to process food. That's why I do best eating my main meal with heavy meat focused at two o'clock in the afternoon, not at six o'clock because if I go to bed at 8, 8 p.m., I go to bed early, but I can't eat and then go to bed, I will literally be throwing up. So uh, TMI, but that's it. But the bodybuilding, I think it works. And if you don't have to eat, you know, figure out what to eat before a workout, ideally timing it earlier and living, leaving yourself time to break down your food. So what type of workout, my friend Bronson is always showing his eggs and steak or eggs and meat, he eats a lot of eggs, but having fish, red steak, uh, pork. Some people can do shrimp is listed here. Turkey, you know, you got to make sure it's quality. So the right diet for athletes, when you're doing an animal based diet, some information on here, but making sure the meat delivery service that's antibiotic free premium meat cuts is key. So wild pastures is a company from paleo Valley is great, but I think, you know, looking at nature's carbs, with your protein, healthy fats is a good option for the endurance athlete. And just to summarize this article says at the end in the frequently asked questions section is a carnivore diet good for endurance athlete. And they say, no, the carnivore diet is not good for endurance athletes. Endurance athletes works out for longer period of time than the typical gym goer requiring a high carb diet to keep them going. As a result, the carnivore diet is not recommended for such athletes because it's more low carb diet. Now that isn't accurate. If you are a low carb athlete, if you're an endurance athlete, we are training ideally 80% of the time at low heart rate. So you're burning primarily fat. Once you are fat adapted and once you've been training max aerobic function, mapitone type of training and get metabolic efficiency testing done ideally, but that's what you're doing 80% of the time. So does that mean you can be carnivore? No, I still think you need the right balance and no strategic carb timing. If you're a female, it's going to be different than a male. So females might have a little something before it could be like 20 grams of some collagen and Laird's creamer that has coconut sweetener and coconut MCTs in it. So you get your fat carbs and protein. So again, it's really why I coach people individually to figure out what works best for them as an individual. So drinking bone broth is on here too. I think that's huge for athletes, you know, so it's great information, you know, carnivore diet, animal-based diet or keto carnivore might be great, but not the keto carnivore diet might be best for an endurance athlete that's fat adapted, but for females, luteal phase, that's where we add in more carbs. And maybe that might become from berries because if we go, well, another article I saved here was from HVMN. It was a couple of years ago with Pete Jacobs. He's Ironman athlete as triathletes here might know. He won 2012 world championship in Kona. I interviewed him, I guess like four or five years ago. I feel like I interviewed him a long time ago, maybe three years ago on the podcast about how Pete has a lot of gut healing issues that he's been working on for years and he does a strict carnivore diet. So there are endurance athletes that do carnivore, but you have to, I think to get all the nutrients as a carnivore, you need to be looking at more organ based meat as he does. And you need to get your nutrients from eating the organs, the heart, the liver, all that stuff. So you can look up Pete Jacobs, learn more. 
Now, if we look at Paul Saladino, he has a chart. If you go to Carnivore MD, you can look up what Paul has on his website, a free download that I'm sharing here on the screen, but what to eat on an animal-based diet. So if you notice, Paul Saladino does not say strict carnivore anymore. He says animal-based diet because he adds in fruit. Obviously, if you watch his Instagram, uh, F blank, you know, F K and Kale, you'll see all of his t-shirts, sweary, swear words on there. And you'll know that he is not a fan of plant toxins. So what does Paul Saldino suggest to eat? Grass-fed beef, pasture-raised pork, pasture-raised chicken, organ meat, bone broth, collagen source, wild-caught fish, and corn soy-free eggs. And looking at low toxic foods as raw local honey, raw dairy, all sweet fruit, avoid the seeds because the seeds are plant toxins, banana, berries, mango, pineapple, watermelon, papaya, oranges, etc. Nuts, or what do you say? I can't read. Non-sweet fruit, seedless and skinless as avocado, olives, pumpkin, squash, zucchini, and cucumber not having the seeds, especially the cucumbers, scoop those seeds out and zucchini, same thing, squash, pumpkin. Yeah. Take out the seeds and tallow and grass fed butter or ghee, which I shared with clients the other day. Ghee, if you go to Costco ever, they have apple cider vinegar and they have big bottles of grass fed, good quality source of ghee. If you want to try ghee, if you don't do well with butter, dairy. So Kerrygold butter is what I choose, but ghee, if you can't do cow dairy or it's good to alternate it in. All right, what are medium toxic foods according to Paul Saladino? White rice, roots, tubers, sweet potatoes, yams, and carrots, fermented vegetables as sauerkraut and pickles, artichoke hearts, herbs as rosemary, thyme, basil, oregano, dill, mint, parsley, and coconut, olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, low metal fish, and that would include wild salmon, sardines, anchovies, and shellfish and cinnamon, which I add in my coffee and is super good. So those are medium toxic foods. Now on this list, if you are working out more intensely or doing longer duration workout that you're going to deplete the muscle glycogen storage tanks, you can tolerate, depending on your carb tolerance test, if you listen to Rob Wolf, and if you test your glucose level, that you don't spike your glucose more than 30 and that glucose comes back down to your baseline between 70 and 90, you can add in sweet potato, yam, carrots, type of roots and tubers. Some people can do white rice, but other people that will spike more than the 30. So again, test and not guess which foods work best for you, your unique individual. So testing with NutriSense for 30, 90 days. Remember that a CGM is 14 days, so you can stagger it, but get that for female. You want the whole female cycle because your glucose will be higher in your luteal phase. So you want to check your glucose throughout your whole hormone cycle, but men can spread it out. But fermented vegetables, I've been reading a lot about, you know, I'm actually going to start making my own fermented yogurt to get probiotics in it based on this book. I'm reading the super gut book by Dr. William Davis, but fermented vegetables, a good way you want to get your probiotics. So Paul Saladino, the carnivore doctor went from just being the animal based diet, but you'll notice here the low toxic food. So also Brad Kearns, my friend learned a lot from Brad or Brad learned a lot from Paul about a nutrient dense diet. So the most nutrient dense diet, you're keeping your foods low toxicity and again, it's an animal-based diet and then timing in these low toxic foods listed on the far left or the green chart. So the medium toxic, I think you, the athlete can tolerate all of these or not. I think it's timing them with your workouts. If it's in between a double day workout in that eight hour period, you can add in those nutrient dense carbohydrates as the roots, tubers, fermented vegetables. And then I think looking at this high toxic list that he has, well, you know, maybe you have it once or twice a week. Maybe you don't have gut issues, but these foods could be good for you. I know a lot of my clients have liver congestion and I need to get their 
support them with nutritional therapy options for improving phase one and phase two liver detoxification. So having broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts are really good sources of cruciferous vegetables that can benefit their liver. But Paul Saldino's list, these are high toxic foods that we can see when we want to avoid. So Paul, Dr. Paul Saldino says what to avoid, avoiding seed oils. You should all know by now, seed oils are the damage to long-term health. Animal fats is preferred way all over based all over all plant-based oils, including olive or avocado oil. Sourcing for meat and organs is also important. Avoiding corn, soy, and grain-fed animals sourced meat is ideal. And processed sugar has no place in a healthy diet and should be avoided as well. So processed for sugars you want to avoid of seed oils, corn, and soy-fed animals. So we want to look at what is on this high toxic list? What is appropriate for an athlete? Beets are really good for bile flow. Uh, I think a lot of people obviously struggle with the lectins, phytates, and oxalates. We'll look at the next list from Dr. Sean Wells, grains, seed oils, legumes. But I would say some people can benefit from broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, horseradish, you know, and seeds, that's a big discussion too. You'll tell, um, some people say cheese seed, flax seed, sunflower, pumpkin, and then others, as Paul Saldino says, avoid. And coffee's on the list and chocolate. So, you know, you, you have to figure out what works best for you. Nightshades, a lot of people can't do. Nightshades are tomato, white potato, eggplant, peppers, chili peppers, and goji berries. A lot of people, if you look at my upgraded formulas labs I just did, if you have high heavy metal fish, tuna, mackerel, halibut, sea bass. I had a client that was having ahi sushi all the time and his mercury levels were off the chart. So four day rotation diet, if you go back to what I learned from Paul Chuck years ago, four day rotation diet, don't have stuff every day, rotate it. But seed oils, we know, grains, we know. If they're properly prepared, soaked and rinsed, maybe some of them are okay for some people. Anyway, so that's what I found from Paul Saldino. If you go to Carnivore MD website, you can find more information on his animal-based diet to reclaim your ancestral birthright to radical health. Okay, and then next I want to find the link here. The Sean Wells, the ingredientologist, has a great blog. And if you want to know what are lectins, what are these anti-nutrients everyone talks about? Why you need to avoid plants and be on an animal-based diet? Well, anti-nutrient Sean Wells has an article on his website, your guide to lectins, phytates, and oxalates, because I always want to put them in one place. Like, how can you keep track of which foods are lectins, which foods are phytates, oxalates, FODMAPs, all this, it gets overwhelming. So we want to avoid anti-nutrients. Those are natural chemicals produced by plants that can give that can cause negative health effects and that interfere with normal absorption of nutrients, minerals, and vitamins they provide. Anti-nutrients are a plant's defense mechanism to prevent any animals from eating them. So it's poison. They cause harm, toxicity, and sometimes death. Animals either evolve to adapt to these chemicals or hormetic stress, or they stop eating a particular plant when they realize it made them sick. So not all plants are good for us. And so I have to go through this really good infographic. Sean always has such good ones with his team, puts them together. So phytates are indigestible and digestible protein that travels through the gut unchanged and high quantities, high quantities. So don't have them every day can damage the gut wall lining. They bind to nutrients and stop their absorption. Oxalates. These are compounds found in many plants. Oxalates bind to minerals and stop their absorption. And then lectins. Dr. Grundy talks about this in his book, The Plant Paradox. Lectins. They serve as a main storage form of phosphorus in the seeds. They bind to minerals and stop their absorption, but also have some health benefits. <laughs> Excuse me. So 80% of kidney stones are formed from the calcium oxalate. So really looking at people having 
spinach every day and kale every day in their shakes and they think they're so healthy, I have to tell them, take them out 30 days and see how you feel. And then put them in maybe once a week if you feel like you have to have them, but it's not needed. So where do you find phytate? Those are almonds, beans, Brazil nuts, lentils, corn, peanuts, wheat, and soybeans. What are your oxalate top foods? That's in spinach, rutabaga, rice, bran, buckwheat, almonds. I can't read wheat, phytates, and so oh, phytates, potatoes. I have my blue blockers and not my readers and my eyes sight <laughs> crap and soybeans. Okay, lectins. Lectins are wheat. Soybeans, red kidney beans, peanuts, tomatoes, potatoes, and chickpeas. Now, potatoes, if you listen to podcasts or articles on safe starches, resistant starches, if they're cooked and cooled, they're more digestible. So if you read about, if you have to have some of these foods, you can look on Ben Greenfield's website, how to properly prepare, soak and rinse certain foods as these to have them improve their digestibility. Now. Sometimes it's easier as I find just to avoid foods and stick to more of an animal-based diet and it really limit the processed foods, the vegetable oils and foods that irritate my gut while lining. Wheat is on each of these lists, phytates, oxalates, lectins. So I have removed wheat. That includes wheat grass. Wheat grass is in athletic greens. I stopped drinking athletic greens and we have like four bags of them and they're hundred dollars a bag. So make sure you look at your lab test. If you get a vibrant one, a zoomer that you, if you react to wheat as I do, I'm highly off the charts. Inflammatory is wheat to my body. Having wheat grass is in that category of wheat. So paleo Valley makes a green drink without wheat grass as an option for you. So this Information on lectins, phytates, oxalates, a great article on seanwells.com. This is from 2020, so it's somewhat recent, your guide to lectins, phytates, and oxalate. So great infographics, love Sean, he's great. Symptoms of lectins, I just wanna to touch on because when I'm working with clients, we look at, I do nutritional therapy assessment, the intake form online, NutriQ, 309 questions and those questions of symptoms, you know, rate it one to five, how often it happens. Those are related to functions in your body. So we can really collect clues to imbalances in your body. Um, but looking at lectins, symptoms are inflammation, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, and joint pain. So that could be part of your health mystery if you're having these odd symptoms. There's no way of measuring lectins in a food, but the highest foods, as I say, are wheat and other grains, beans, legumes, and then vegetables and fruit and dairy. So test and not guess, do your own food elimination test, track your heart rate variability, track your heart rate so you know your baseline to know when you've had something that you ate something that is inflammatory. So lectin information, foods low in lectins. We love olives, we love avocados, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, onions, asparagus, lettuce, and cucumbers peeled without the seeds. Lettuce, I don't think, I've been avoiding them because I find they don't agree with me anymore. And then you can go into what phytates are, what do they do, where do you find them, rice bran, linseed, soybeans, wheat bran, and germ. Uh, wheat germ, almonds, and Brazil nuts, and beans. So looking at those symptoms, and then of course we hear about oxalates, symptoms there and oxalates, joint pain, inflammation, painful itchy eyes, chronic pain around the vulva, nausea, and vomiting. Which, you know, I think so many people have issues and they don't realize it could be what you're eating and they go see the doctor and I'm experiencing this now with family friends. They don't know what to do. They go see the doctor. And what do they know about nutritional therapy? You know, they're going to give, spend many tests. The people continue to have illness, vomiting or diarrhea, and they can't get results. So that's when I think you need, doctors need to refer out 
So you can look at avoiding anti-nutrients. The diet changes Sean Wells team talks about here is the anti-nutrients come from food. And the best way to address the problem is to, of course, adjust your diet. So diets that aim to remove or reduce anti-nutrients. A lot of clients, I start them on an AIP diet for six weeks, a primal or paleo type of diet. The Whole30 plan is also popular. A carnivore diet, a ketogenic diet, or I like to do a keto carnivore combo, but animal-based diet. I don't like to give names, anything, but we're just going to look at a real food diet to figure out how your body feels, track your metabolic typing, track your reaction, energy, your symptoms after you eat. So great information on here. Again, so soaking and sprouting, fermentation, boiling are really essential for people that if you are going to continue these foods, properly prepare them. Soak, sprout, fermentation, and boiling, healing, deceiting, and making sure they're not filled. So going refined and looking at, you know, what you can swap. So getting that nutrition from beef, salmon, eggs, and butter and liver is actually way more nutrition that, and I was a salad queen, remember, before I started eating meat a few years ago, but all the beef, salmon, eggs, butter, liver, those are way more nutrient dense than having a salad. And as you know, we've been talking a lot about protein and figuring that out is important. Okay, last bit here. I'm going to go over this another show, but I did a precision health report and you can get a blood test and they measure a bunch of different markers and put together this chart, cardiovascular risk. Look at that. Wow. It's high. <laughs> so you think you're high. great, but my cholesterol is high. So, uh, you want to look at, Hey, maybe my genetics, I shouldn't have so much saturated fat. I need to reduce up to a low carb Mediterranean type of diet, more keto Mediterranean. So you're going to look at these charts. They'll tell you precision health reports, understanding your cardio metabolic risk report. So we're going to do a podcast on this, uh, my list my 10 year risk, my lifetime risk. If we go back up, I had, you know, my, my risk for diabetes. And this is why I've been working hard on my carb timing and getting the nutrients I need and all that. So that's a great chart to look at. We're going to do a podcast, but how they do an insulin resistance syndrome, metabolic syndrome test, what they look at my waist, blood pressure, glucose, fasting level, triglycerides, so that score was pretty nice and clean, but my cardiovascular risk, I need to look at the why. If it's oxidative stress, what's driving that up? So I just got that back. Lastly, I did a full blood panel from Vibrant Wellness and looked at all my hormones and my testosterone, dihydrohydro testosterone level was under 3.2 and it should be 6.5 or higher up to 50. And so you got to look at all this information and then we're going to put it in a whole picture together. What is optimal, the reference range. I still don't use their reference ranges. I put them in a lab report myself. These are FDN ranges. Here's, you know, my functional ranges and I put them in the chart Excel spreadsheet and then I can go, okay, low, that's high. That's not with the levels I want. And then I can add correlations as my previous test. I did this before and I can go back and go, okay, you know, having low glucose isn't ideal, but if you're too low, hypoglycemia, adrenal hypofunction, if my BUN levels are high or low, what does that mean? Kidney function, protein, if it's too low, hey, I'm eating 10 of protein, but I'm not digesting and absorbing it. Maybe I have malnutrition, malabsorption, protein deficiency, maybe I have H pylori that I can't even break down my protein. It's more looking at the why. So what I do with clients is get their blood chemistry panel, ideally get your doctor to do it, but they do not do all these markers and look at them in a functional range instead of this normal range is so wrong. And then look at what that information means. So if my, this is last year and these numbers are way better now, cause I address these issues, but parasites, food, environmental allergies, sensitivities, that might be asonophils, why it's high. So it was a nine a year ago and now it's down, but 
it should be between zero to 3%. So looking at what that means, that's a clue. Hey, I need to do the GI map. This is why we don't just do one test. We want to look at the whole picture. So that's what I do. And looking at with clients too, the acute and chronic stress response. So why are these things high? What are our hormones? What contributes to this metabolic chaos? Well, I've talked to about this over the years on the podcast, but emotional stress, fear, guilt, excitement. We have physical stress, obviously exercising too much fractures, muscle injuries, nerve compression. These are all contributors to excess external stressors. Then we have these hidden internal sources of stress that we just can see in a GI test. And we just went over my hair mineral test. So we can see what is causing inflammation in my body. So energy production, body chemistry, immune activity. If we look at this chart, I'm showing on the video, elevated cortisol to DHA ratio that can lower your insulin sensitivity. So you're more insulin insensitive glucose utilization, blood sugar levels are up. Your gluconeogenesis is up. So you're having issues in creating energy, osteoporosis, fat accumulation, protein breakdown, salt and water retention, your immune activity, your secretary IgA is plummeting. That's your immune system in your gut well lining and your immune cells. So you can see just this, what happens to metabolic chaos is just a great chart to see how everything's connected and how we want to work on not living life as a race and identify those external stressors, those energy robbers you have in life. For me, it was running my own fitness studio for 10 years, just broke me down and pile that on top of training at a high level for endurance events as Ironmans every year, plus marathons and plus long distance cycling and stuff in the off season from triathlon. So I was doing something year round that didn't serve me well. And that's why I'm not racing anymore to this day. My body can't, it's burned out and I can't create that energy production for long distance events anymore. So that's kind of my purpose, why I'm trying to help you. So just kind of think of that metabolic chaos, how it's going to impact your hormones, your muscle skeletal health, your carbohydrate metabolism, your immune regulation, fat protein metabolism, mucosal barrier dysfunction, which is leaky gut, digestive disorders, you know, really looking at this whole picture, I think is essential and just how we want to address the whole athlete and really how to optimize you from the inside out by looking at all this data. So going back to what you should eat, when you should eat, you know, should I be carnivore or animal-based diet? Look at these markers. I didn't show this one, but Dr. Jockers has this great inflammatory lab marker that I put on my Facebook page, low carb athlete, but what markers should you get done? Which are the top 12 inflammatory lab markers to measure? And all to labs, you can go to and order all these for pretty affordable price. And you can just go to altolabs.com to Debbie Potts coaching on there. And you can order all these labs for affordable rate or head to their homepage. Whoops. That's my website, but you can learn more about their lab markers there. So if you go to home on Alta labs, you can get a hormone panel for men and women. 20%. They're always 20% off, but these weekly promotions are always there. But if you scroll down, see 20%, it's always 20% off comprehensive markers. So that's what I suggest to clients to do. And then add on other markers. If you need more tests on hormones or inflammation, we add those in on here. So good prices. I know insulin's $26. So super affordable. All right. So that is my 10 minutes longer than I was going to do. But if you have any questions, head to debbiepotts.net. And if you want to know what topics I should dive into or want to tell me what to talk about on the next solo podcast, just head to my website, debbiepotts.net and send me a message on there and I will be glad to dive into it. So until then, enjoy every life, every life, every day to the fullest. So talk soon.